<laughs> okay, so I guess we can start now, uh, as all the uh, presenters are here. And uh, uh, I guess all of you know that, uh, so the, the, the Q&A session will be streamed on the YouTube. If any, any of you uh, doesn't like it, we will move your talk to the end. So everyone is fine, okay with uh, streaming, right? Okay, I see no objection. So let's just uh, start with the first uh, first uh, Q&A uh, talk by Manuel and Jacob. I guess everyone knows that they got the best presentation award and congratulations again. So you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Our paper is about temporal constraint satisfaction problems that can be expressed in fixed point logic. Fixed point logic is an important formalism to express problems in polynomial time, polynomial time problems. And um, tem a temporal constraint satisfaction problem is a constraint satisfaction problem where the constraints are from a fixed finite set of relations. And each of the relations is definable over the linear order of the rationals. This class contains many problems um, that have been studied in the literature, like the betweenness problem and so on. For for finite domain constraint satisfaction problems, the class of problems that are in fixed point logic is quite well understood. If a finite domain constraint satisfaction problem is in fixed point logic, then it's even in data log, which is the existential positive fragment of fixed point logic. So there's some sort of strong collapse going on. And we were looking at the situation for these infinite domain temporal constraint satisfaction problems, which problems can be expressed in fixed point logic. And uh, the situation is uh, different there. There are temporal constraint satisfaction problems that are in fixed point logic, but not in data log. Yeah, so it's a more complicated world. And um, uh, yeah, now I hand over to yeah. my colleague. So uh, we present a full classification of temporal CSPs, which can be uh, expressed in data log, in fixed point logic, and in fixed point logic with the Boolean rank operator. And uh, our results also imply that uh, if a temporal CSP is expressible in fixed point logic, is inexpressible in fixed point logic, then it is also inexpressible in fixed point logic with counting. And for our proof of inexpressibility, we use an old construction of uh, Guravich and Shellach, the so-called multipeats. Uh, our classification can be also described in terms of satisfiability of uh, certain height one identities for polymorphism clones. And uh, these uh, height one identities might be a possible candidate for expressibility of CSPs in FP for a much larger class of CSPs than uh, the temporal CSPs. Uh, namely the CSPs of uh, finitely bounded homogeneous structures. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we are already past our two minutes uh, <laughs> and we uh, will answer your questions if you have some. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So if anyone has any question, just uh, jump in and uh, go ahead. Okay, so I have a question, if I may. I'm, uh, Okay, so uh, it is uh, well, great to know what is the characterization of LFP for temporal constraint satisfaction problems, but it's even much more interesting how it would be in general, like for redux of finitely bound homogeneous structure. That's why uh, my question is, uh, your proof is very much based on uh, Manuel's uh, paper with Jan Kara from 2008, but could you prove the same classification or at least membership in LFP, just assuming that you, you have a reduct of Q, uh, by which I mean a structure which has probably some concrete finite band and that you have your polymorphism. So this kind of proof would be much more easy to generalize uh, than this proof as it is now, I think. Uh, yeah, so, so you wonder, um, if, if I just promised some very strong identities or polymorphisms, the existence of some polymorphisms that satisfy some strong identities, can we derive uh, an algorithm from the polymorphisms only, right? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, this is a very good question. So, so, so there are some identities, of course, you know them very well. There are uh, quasi near unanimity polymorphisms that imply containment in data log. Things like that for LFP are much harder 
And I must say it's ongoing work. Yeah? We, I, I think this will eventually be there, but not at the moment. That's why it's so important to have examples. Uh, and this uh, paper will provide you some very nice examples of situations where it works. So basically the, the identities that we have can be rather used uh, to prevent constructability of uh, certain temporal CSPs where we know that these are inexpressible of in, in, uh, in fixed point logic. So we rather describe the, the inability to, to, let's say, PP construct these uh, temporal CSPs than that we would use these identities to produce certain algorithms. So we don't have the constructive step. Right. Yeah. If I may, I have one more question. Um, so my question is, uh, so formulas in LFP can be very, I imagine very wild. And can you think uh, that for instance, you need a certain fragment of LFP like, uh, or this is first question. And the second, uh, do you have, is there something like canonical LFP program? <laughs> yeah, this is a very good question again. So Michael is probably inspired from the situation in data log. If uh, you uh, use data log to solve infinite domain CSPs or finite domain CSPs, if the infinite domain CSPs are omega categorical, then you have something like a canonical data log program. And you only have to worry about those. And for LFP, we don't have such a thing. So it's a very good question. But again, I must say, I'm, uh, it, this is rather future work. It's very promising, but I, at the moment, I, I can't tell you much more. Mm. Okay. I mean, we Thank know you. that the algorithms for temporal CSPs have some similarities to, uh, to a, a different class of uh, also finitely bounded homogeneous uh, CSPs, which are also difficult to tackle, the phylogenetic uh, mm -hmm. reconstruction CSPs. And, so the algorithms bear certain similarities, which can be used to produce similar uh, LFP sentences, but these are also just two examples. So we would need more examples. Thank you. I don't want to take more time. Thank you. So any other questions? I guess there is a question in, in Slack, but uh, Manuel has already addressed, right? Yeah, the question in Slack concerned um, one of the central steps, how exactly we use multi -peeds. So this is, was a fair question because in our paper, this takes a long, it's a long technical part. And so in Slack, um, Jakob and I, we sketched um, the strategy this is also the part where our third author, who is unfortunately not here among us now, Vit Pakusa, I would like to, to mention him. He, in particular, in this part, he made great, uh, he contributed great ideas. And so, so this is a very nice uh, way to use these old results uh, about yeah. multi -peeds. Yeah, so, so basically the, the proof uses um, already known fact that the isomorphism problem for multi peaks which were introduced by Gurevich and Schillach can be reduced to um, solvability of, uh, of certain uh, inhomogeneous systems of uh, linear Boolean equations. And uh, basically, these, so these uh, sy systems also have uh, the property that their homogeneous companions have no non-trivial solution. And uh, we, we use them to uh, to basically extract instances of, uh, of a specific temporal CSP where, where we were at a suspicion that it uh, should not be expressible in fixed point logic. And uh, we, we, for these instances, we can, we can show that they cannot be uh, basically differentiated in uh, fixed point logic, uh, even with counting. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit more technical. And uh, yeah, I think we should not go into deeper details. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so if not, uh, so thank Manu and Jacob again. So let's move to the second paper. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you.
Okay, so our second paper is on uh, uh, descriptive complexity of real computations and the probabilistic independence logic. So, uh, should I start? Okay. Yes, please, Johnny. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so this is a joint work with Mika Hannula, Juha Kwonde, and Jan van den Busch, and Mika and Juha are present, and I think Mika can also answer questions if, if there is something to be asked. So, so the logic in a syntactical side is an extension of first-order logic with this kind of uh, atomic statements that can uh, describe properties of sets of, of data, let's say. And in the semantical side, we work with finite structures. And instead of uh, assignments, like in first-order logic, we have um, sets of assignments. And in this probabilistic setting, each assignment has a weight and those weights then add up to one. So we have distributions over assignments and then we can say some, some probabilistic notions like the, like the Y is probabilistically independent of Z in the sense of probabilistic independence from statistics. And uh, the, one interesting part here is that uh, the disjunction is, uh, is defined with respect to convex combinations and that somehow brings it close to, to, to separation logics where you have the separating conjunction. And, uh, and quantification is in, you just add a new colon and, and do that. So essentially in this probabilistic setting our, our formally then uh, give, give properties of this kind of uh, distributions of data. Okay, so, so we know that in, um, in a non-probabilistic setting, it, it, independence logic captures NP on Turing machine computation model. So what we wanted to do here is to think what happens in this probabilistic independence logic. And we found out that there we need to leave the realm of, of Turing machines and, uh, and think about computation devices that compute uh, directly with, uh, with real numbers like BSS model mm, machines. And here the input is a finite string of reals. So this is the configuration of the machine looks something like that. And then the machine then can uh, can manipulate the contents of the registers with arithmetic instructions. And then an important rule here is a branch rule that allows the, the program to branch depending on the content of the registers. And what we did here is that we had to define this kind of restricted version of a BSS machine that we call separate branching BSS machine and the difference here is that instead of having this kind of um, arbitrary branching, we allowed only this kind of branching the separate closed intervals. So, so we have two real numbers and, and we have the same branch rule, but we are only allowed to branch if the content of a register is below some, some fixed constant or above some other fixed constant. And if we are a between, then the machine must reject. So this is a weaker construct than this one here. So then what did we show? So we showed that this, this, this probabilistic independence logic then captures NP on these kind of restricted BSS machines. And the proof was we are, uh, first translating to a fragment of existence or second logic and then showing the correspondence there. And uh, the logic that we had here is, is um, existence or second logic on, uh, on so-called R structures. So we have a finite structure and, and then it's en enriched with, uh, with real numbers, with arithmetic. So it's a, it's a similar result than greater than mayor for NPR and their logic. And 
Also, what's interesting is that um, if we only consider finite structures, so inputs of Boolean strings, then our logic captures um, a natural fragment of the complex class exist R, which is uh, all true sentences of existential theory of real and, and close that with polynomial reductions. And uh, so we get a similar fragment of that as this logic here. And, and, and lastly, what we do is that we separate these two complex classes and how we do it is that we we give a characterization of, of languages that can be decided in these uh, SPS machines and prove that they can only decide essentially closed sets or countable disjoint unions of closed sets. So th that can be related to the characterization of uh, of Bloom et al. of PSS de decidable languages, which are countable disjoint unions of semi algebraic sets. Okay, so here is the um, overview of, of what we did in the paper. So, I guess. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, are there any questions? I guess we already have one from Slack. So I just read it out. Could one restrict the separate branch nodes in SBSs further? For example, if to if xi is greater or equal to epsilon, then go to beta, else reject. Or if xi greater or equal to epsilon plus, then um, go to beta, else if xi is smaller than epsilon, then accept, else reject. So that's the question from Slack. So, so if I if I understood the the question correctly when I read it from Slack, the, um, the point is that in that restriction, there is not really any branching. So, so all programs go from top to down and they might accept in the, in the between, but, but that means that since there's no branching and a program is just a finite list of instructions. So, so that means that your machine has, let's say, like 27 instructions. So then, it, then if you have that kind of branching rule, you can only have 27 steps. And then the computation holds in 27 steps. So I guess in that sense, that's not so reasonable. But of course you can find some other, other restrictions of the branching rule that might make sense. Any other questions? Yeah, any other questions? So let me just have one, but probably this is uh, quite vague. So uh, another way to understand uh, descriptive complexity is to understand this as an expression complexity. You are given a structure, you fix the formula. I'm wondering what about combined complexity? You are looking at model checking, you're given a structure, given a formula, you ask whether the structure satisfies this formula. What's the complexity of this for your independence logic, uh, probabilistic independence logic? Mm -hmm. So I think we haven't considered that at okay. all. Do you remember me if we have any? any... No, we haven't. We haven't thought about model checking yet. But, but I think for the standard dependence logic in team semantics isn't model checking next time complete, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, it might be quite high for, for this logic, but I don't have any 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 at this point any idea yeah it's mu it must be higher much higher yes. yeah it must, must be much higher of course at uh, that. any other questions so if not uh, so thank you again and uh, we move to the third speaker and uh, uh, it's pavel 
talking about intermediate problem in modular circuit satisfiability. <clears throat> Please, you have the floor. Maybe unmute the microphone. <laughs> Maybe it works now. Yeah, it's, oh, it works. Perfect. 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 So um, uh, I'm going to present a result uh, obtained jointly with uh, Piotr Kawałek and Jacek Krzaczkowski. And uh, this uh, concerns satisfiability, which uh, I mean, the classical one the over, over Bulan realm is uh, uh, simply well, uh, can, can be regarded two, 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 two ways. One way is uh, that uh, give, give, gave rise to a constraint satisfaction problem. The other one it gives rise to, to, to equation solving. The, the main difference between those two settings is that in CSP, we have the external conjunction in logic, while in um, solving equations, uh, we don't have it, especially when we concentrate on a single equation, not on a system of equations. So, uh, uh, well, well, um, so uh, uh, what, what, what we do, we are interested in solving equations or in other words, uh, satisfiability in circuits, but not over Bulan algebras or its uh, reducts, but over arbitrary finite algebra. So we have as many values as we want and uh, the operation we like uh, the most. The connection with uh, uh, CSP uh, is explained in here uh, uh, so, essentially, for system of equations, it's uh, equivalent to C to CSP. What's going on here? We can see your slide. Oh, okay. Because I I I I I, I can't for for some reason. <laughs> uh, so, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with system of equation, uh, we can translate. Uh, we can we can change one template to the other, the relational one to algebraic one, and replace system of equations by uh, by um, a CSP query. For a single equation, the, the translation works only one way, and probably, as I will show later, uh, it's not true the the, the, the other way. So in uh, uh, again, uh, uh, so two years ago in our Lix papers, we did a characterization of finite algebras with polytime algorithm for circuit satisfiability, but there was some small gap, which uh, as we now know is not that small. So we haven't filled it even now, but we have a uh, quite a big progress. The gap is between so-called nilpotent, uh, but not super nilpotent algebras. And it has a lot of connection with modular circuits. So circuits uh, where we have uh, modular gates counting the, uh, I mean, two valued over Bulan realm. Uh, 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 <clears throat> And what uh, 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 occurred to be really important here is uh, how long is the chain of alternating uh, primes. Uh, <clears throat> And coming to the results, uh, uh, I will present it using an example. Uh, we have an algebra, which is essentially an expansion of an abelian group, which is a product of something. Uh, uh, what, we, what, what, what we assume here is that this chain of prime is alternating. Uh, and on the circuit side, we have circuits such that on ice level, we have only mod sub pi gates. Uh, what we really do need here for one bound <clears throat> is something which we call the strong exponential size hypothesis, which simply says that in such setting, the, uh, 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 the gates that, that, that count the, the, the function end on, on arbitrary arity grow, uh, grow uh, exponentially. 
Uh, and with the help of this and the help of uh, uh, <clears throat> exponential time hypothesis, we have a lower and upper bound, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, sub-exponential. Uh, uh, so the lower bound uh, assumes uh, exponential time hypothesis. The upper bound, this 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 strong uh, exponential size hypothesis. And in case of probabilistic algorithm, we even do match the exponent for 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 deterministic knot. So the conclusions of that is that uh, well. Under those two hypotheses, there is no uh, dichotomy for circuit satisfiability, which stays in a weak contrast to, to, to CSP. Therefore, there is no equivalence, which I started with uh, at the very beginning. Again, in contrast with that system of equations uh, is equivalent to CSP. And in fact, because we have one-way translation, circuit satisfiability has strictly bigger expression power than CSP. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're considering these congruence modular varieties. Is there any other natural examples than group where for these varieties this lower bounds apply so for rings i think there is yeah you have the same yeah, for that's... rings and you, you you know you you have the same for uh, for uh, but but for yeah also also for rings and for for loops or quasi groups or whatever So in fact, we have- So also for these quasi groups and loops, you find some cases uh, which have only quasi polynomial time algorithms yeah, on the ETH yeah. and which are not NP complete. Yeah, but be careful here because what we do consider is uh, circuit satisfiability, which, which is independent on the language. So you can add uh, finitely many uh, additional terms. It's not like in the pure group language. Okay. And can I ask another question? In your talk, you had this D15 example that you have these lower bounds. Uh, yeah, that's right. Can you say something? How far could this be extended? Or um, is there <laughs> hope to have a, like a dichotomy for these classes of groups, it's in P, and for other class of groups, it's uh, under ETH, it's not in P? Uh, okay, as you perfectly know, to get the lower bound from ETH, you need a, a short, uh, relatively short, not fully exponential, but something like uh, two to the some kind of root of n uh, uh, expression uh, to 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 express the conjunction, because we need we need this internal conjunction expressible by a term. And uh, with such two levels, you can do it if, uh, uh, if uh, um, uh, let's say, th th that's still an ongoing work. But if you, so, so in, in the group D15, you have a different prime uh, on the top, which is two and two other primes, three and five below it. And once you alternate such uh, such uh, such uh, sequences with uh, with, with uh, let's say two different primes at each consecutive level, different from the from 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 from, from the ones on the on on, on the upper level. Uh, on, on the very top, one prime is is sufficient, but uh, going down, you need uh, two new two new primes. And then you can repeat the construction. 
you, you will get a shorter uh, yes. shorter conjunction and therefore uh, uh, you can use ETH to show the lower bound. For upper bound, however, the situation is much complex because to prove the upper bound, you need an algorithm and you need a, a better understanding of what's going on, not only locally to create this, uh, this term that express a conjunction, but you, you need a uh, control over all possible terms. Okay. okay. Yeah, I guess we uh, have run out of time. So let, uh, thank you again. And uh, we move to the next one. And uh, this is um, by Michael on the relational width of first order expansions of finite bounded homogeneous binary course with bounded uh, strict width. So please. Uh, uh, do you see my uh, screen? Yes. Uh, okay, so I don't know how to, I never work, uh, used it before. No, it doesn't. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the title is very long, but it's basically about uh, one algorithm. It's about algorithm uh, establishing minimality. There are two parameters, K and L. So we talk about constant satisfaction problems. And uh, we start with an instance and we add constraints so that every L element subset of variables was covered by a scope of some constraint. And then we remove tuples in order to obtain the following situation so that for any two constraints, the projections to uh, an K element subset of variables was the same uh, across the constraints. And this is basically, this algorithm solves basically the same constant satisfaction problem than local consistency, which is uh, uh, maybe uh, broader known. And these exact numbers KL uh, can be, may be seen as the amount of consistency needed to solve uh, uh, the CSP. And it's known that if the structure A is finite, uh, then uh, if the relational width is, is finite, if these numbers KL are finite, then they are either exactly one, one, or it's not one, one, but it's two, three. So this is a collapse of hierarchy. Uh, and this, and this is a result by Libor Barto based on a previous result by Barto and Kojic, uh, which characterize, characterize algebraically uh, all finite structures with bounded width. So, uh, and there's, there are another structures, uh, infinite structures that Manuel was talking about, like redux of finitely bound homogeneous structure, uh, of structures for which also algebraic approach work. So we can also ask about the, this exact characterization of, uh, of this amount of consistency of this numbers KL. Uh, but when I was working on this question, um, uh, there was no algebraic characterization, and now it's known that there's not at all. Uh, so this is why uh, I looked at structures with have uh, a bit strong uh, condition uh, that, that are structures uh, which are called uh, with bounded strict width. So this minimality algorithm not only solves the um, the uh, template, but but also if this uh, template is already uh, minimal, then uh, every partial solution can be extended to a total solution. Uh, if you listen to talk by Libor uh, Barto on Wednesday, then he called this uh, template great. Uh, so uh, my uh, contribution is, is the following. I start with a liberal finitely bounded homogeneous binary core with some kind of finitely bound homogeneous structures. Then I go to the expansion, first order expansion, which has this bounded strict width or equivalently it has oligopotent quasi unanimity operation. And this is B. And I show that this B has relational width exactly to LA, where LA is the biggest uh, forbidden substructure of A. Uh, so uh, for special, uh, cases, if we look at random graph, then the biggest forbidden substructure is, is two. 
uh, and I have this result two three. Okay, because this second number has to be at least uh, at least three. It's because of equality. If we look for uh, like uh, finitely bounded Hanson uh, diagraph, uh, then uh, that forbids the like, tournaments of size seven, but not less. Uh, then I have these numbers two seven, and it works for all like binary cores, uh, which don't don't uh, forbid substructures of size three, four, five, and six. And this is what I call liberal. Uh, and binary core, I have basic, it's basically like colored. Uh, tournament. So for every two different elements, I have an arrow of some one of kappa colors. And uh, that's it, basic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so in your definition of liberal, can you explain where these numbers come from? So what happens if we have structures that are forbidden of size six? Why, why six? Yeah, what, uh... uh, six is because it's three times two. Yes, okay, <laughs> I follow, yeah, but. <laughs> okay, so this is basically because uh, when I uh, prove, I look in the clone, I look on, uh, in the relational clone, I look uh, basically at, uh, at relations of length at most six in a way. And the six is not like six uh, for everything is two times three because two is uh, like uh, the size or it's, it's two because it's an edge, right? I think if I looked over like hypergraphs uh, with uh, these edges of three elements, then I would have like three, uh, three times three, nine or something like that. It's because I don't really care about structure which uh, relations which uh, are very of, of very long arity i only care about this which uh, has six six hmm. Interesting. and what can you say about uh, Q, uh, redux of q uh, your result so my result doesn't say about uh, redux of yes. Q. Yes, okay, sorry, but what can you say? Uh, not in your uh, result, but uh, do you know? My impression is, is that whenever you give me a, a, a structure, like I, I think it's the same. I mean, the result is the same, but, uh, but it's a concrete structure. I think I could show it for results of Q like uh, within a day or two, but I'm of course much more interested in uh, general results. So I believe it works. Okay, so I think that the same numbers hold for it would be f two three, right? Because uh, the, the greatest, for the, the biggest forbidden substructure is like the C three. Uh, May I ask yes. another question? Uh, of course. Uh, so how stable is this bounded relational width under, um, say, primitive positive interpretability? I guess it only depends on the polymorphism clone, yeah? But does it depend only on the topological polymorphism clone? Is it stable under primitive positive interpretations? No, I, I didn't consider these questions very natural, but I, I don't know. I, no, my, my main motivation was, was to take as general structure as I can, some polymorphism and to prove something. And I, I didn't consider these questions very uh, good, but I don't know. Yeah, so, chair. yeah um, so uh, if there is no other uh, uh, questions, uh, thank you again. And uh, we move to the fourth uh, talk. So about sparse yeah. hashing. I think uh, Michael has to turn off his screen sharing. Yeah. I have to, I have to do something. Yes, now I think now it's all good. Yeah.
Okay, I guess you can see the screen. Um, so this is joint work with S. Akshay from IIT uh, Bombay. And I guess, as you can see, we decided the author order randomly. Um, so in this problem, uh, what uh, we are looking at in this paper is the problem of model counting, where you have a set of variables and a formula of these variables. And um, uh, the problem is to count the number of uh, assignments to these variables that make the formula evaluate to true. So for example, if formula is x1 or x2, then there are three satisfying assignments to this formula. And the problem of counting is to answer number three. And in the last few years, there has been a lot of work in uh, this hashing best approach where there's a promise of scalability and uh, theoretical guarantees. So essentially the hashing best approach is uh, we are we usually are going to construct a hash function and typically from this class of pairwise independent hash functions. And for each of these, we construct these m random XRs. The way we construct every XR is that we choose every variable with probability half, and then we XR them together. So the expected size of each XR in this case would be n over two if you have n variables. And the key idea here is that we can reduce uh, counting to the set queries where essentially every set query is the formula f conjected with these random XRs. We are very interested from practical perspective and the key motivation here is that, well, we are going to use these set solvers because they are, there's a closest approximation to NP oracles. And in that case, uh, the performance of these solvers degrade with increase in the size of XRs. Um, and the issue here is that if you just try to construct a sparse XR, then they don't have their pairwise independence guarantees. By sparsity, I mean uh, every XR with a small number of variables in each XR. So the question that we have been looking at is, uh, can we design XR algorithms with sparse XRs? Uh, the key theoretical result here is that answer is yes. Uh, so in particular, if you pick every variable with probability P, then the expected size of each XR will be N times P. And uh, the key um, theoretical uh, lemma that one uh, typically cares about is about this random variable, which is number of solutions in a randomly chosen cell. And in this case, we can show that the expected number of solutions in a cell is just the total number of solutions divided by total number of cells. Furthermore, variance can be upper bounded uh, by, uh, by uh, this expectation time a small constant or in the other way, which is, this is called dispersion index, which is the ratio of variance to expectation can be upper bounded by 1.1. Uh, so what we were able to do is to uh, improve the P from half. So if I just write as M by two over M to log M by M. So this really gives uh, sparse XRs. And um, not only in uh, theory, uh, these improvements do translate strongly in practice, and for that, we took the state-of-art um, approximate counting algorithm, uh, which is in its fourth version, approximately four. And uh, we combined it with our sparse XORs, and we see that we are able to, uh, so these are the set of benchmarks, variables. This is the log of the counts that we get. And uh, these are the time taken by approximately four, and here is the time taken by approximately five, and here is the speed up. So as you can see that, um, as the formulas become more and more complex, uh, we uh, tend to get higher and higher speed up. And in particular, there are cases where approximately four would time out after 5,000 seconds that we can solve within, um, you know, in some cases, just within 100 seconds. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first sparse XR best scheme that can achieve speed up without loss of theoretical guarantees. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So let me have one. So how does your result compare to classic, uh, this FPRAS in counting complexity like uh, Jerome, um, for good, uh, Sinclair's algorithms. So uh, in this case, we are looking at uh, the formula general 
uh, Boolean formula. So the problem would is NP hard. Um, mm -hmm. So this is uh, where, I, I mean, it's NP hard. So uh, most of the line of work from Jerem Sinclair on MCMC approaches is typically concerned about uh, problems where the underlying decision problem is P time and can we design an FP RAS, um, yeah. which is not our concern here. One uh, other result that we had about two years ago is that uh, this scheme also gives an FP RAS uh, when underlying formula is, let's say, DNF formula. So when it's a disjunctive normal form, then you can use uh, the same idea about using XORs and you get a FP RAS. So you don't have to go through the Monte Carlo approach in that case. Okay. Other questions? Then let me have another one. So perhaps, perhaps I missed this. Uh, let's say, assuming that uh, you guarantee, uh, you have some guarantee on your set solver. Can you prove any theoretical result on your uh, your algorithms? Um, yes. Uh, well, if we can have, so what would be very interesting, but that turns out to be really hard to understand the behavior of set solvers, is if we can have some guarantee about their performance depending on the size of XORs, then mm -hmm. we could prove uh, guarantees on the speed ups that you would get. Um, but such results. So the results are fairly hard. I mean, there is some work on um, sparse for if you restrict the um, underlying formula to be from a you know, certain class, then you could show that sparse XORs are much more efficient. Uh, so in the very restricted setting, you could expect to have some theorem that also talks about that, what would be that improvement in time complexity due to uses of sparse XORs. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So if not, so thank you deep again and uh, we move to the last talk. Thank you. Thank you. So the last talk is on the Weizfeller Lehman dimension of finite groups. So Yandrik will be speaking. So please. Uh, yeah, thanks. I hope you can see my slides now. Yes. Um, yeah. So what I'm presenting here is uh, joint work with Pascal Schweitzer on, uh, as you said, the Weizfeller Lehman um, dimension of finite groups. And uh, the broader context of this work is the isomorphism problem of finite groups and especially algorithmic aspects thereof. So um, here we consider groups um, represented by multiplication tables, as you can see um, in the top left here. And um, in this form, the isomorphism problem is closely related to the graph isomorphism problem. So um, for example, there's a reduction to graph isomorphism by encoding this multiplication table uh, in terms of a multiplication graph, like in the top right here. And um, yeah, so in particular, what we want to do here is investigate um, what Weisfeller-Lehmann refinement can do in, in this group uh, isomorphism situation. And um, yeah, in terms of graphs, the Weisfeller-Lehmann um, refinement procedures uh, provide non-isomorphism tests through canonical labelings uh, or canonical colorings of graphs. And um, they are very well understood at this point. They are quite powerful in lots of situations and um, form the basis of lots of approaches to the graph isomorphism problem. And um, furthermore, there are interesting connections to descriptive complexity and ehrenfreuch frise type games and, and these things. And it would certainly be nice to have uh, similar results for groups as well. So um, yeah, what we do here um, in this paper is first of all, we uh, develop weisfeller lehmann algorithms for, for finite groups and um, then uh, later in the second part of our work, we um, use the uh, zeiffurer immermann construction, um, which is shown here in the, in the bottom right, um, to obtain interesting examples of, of groups. So uh, a bit more formally, our main results are, um, first of all, to introduce Weisfeller-Lehmann algorithms for groups, 
And actually we look at a, a spectrum of possible definitions here because it's not completely clear how to define these things um, in, in the details. Um, but we then show that asymptotically, it, it doesn't really matter what you do. So um, we develop a robust not a notion of Weisfeller Lima dimensionality. And um, yeah, then um, using the CFI construction, we, we construct an infinite family of groups um, or of pairs of groups um, to be precise, which have Weisfeller Lima dimension three, but uh, look very similar in terms of traditional invariants. Um, in particular, um, Let's not go into details here, but but in particular, these um, have similar subgroup profiles, which is something which has only been um, investigated in the literature, um, yeah, only very recently. So, um, yeah, the big question, of course, uh, which remains, is determine to determine the weiss lima dimension of interesting uh, group classes, or even of uh, finite groups in general. And um, in any case, if, if this dimension would be globally bounded, then, then this would imply a polynomial time solution to the isomorphism problem. Um, but um, if uh, the the lima dimension of, of a certain group class or groups in general is unbounded, then we get still um, interesting examples of uh, yeah, hard to distinguish and, and formula similar groups in a way which is uh, yeah, expressible through these weisfeller lima algorithms. Um, yeah, but I think there are many other things to discuss, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you. Questions? I would like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. So this family of groups that you discovered, does it fall into any natural class of groups where the group isomorphism problem can be solved in polynomial time, is known to be solvable in polynomial time? And if so, how? Uh, um, so um, these groups are, I'm, I mean, I'm, I might go back to the slide. So um, these groups are in a certain um, class, which is very interesting for the isomorphism problem um, at the moment in the literature, because um, these are structurally um, kind of simple groups. So um, they have all, all their elements have order P. So for a fixed prime, all, all the elements to, to, to the power of this prime are the identity element. Um, they are what is called null potent of class two, which is in a way saying they are closely related to abelian groups, um, which themselves have a very simple structure theory. So um, despite all these things making these groups appear simple in a structural sense, for the class of groups which have these properties, we don't know efficient isomorphism tests, and we don't know anything better than the, than the um, basically brute force bound um, which is the general bound just by comparing generating sets. Um, but the groups we consider themselves have a polynomial time isomorphism test just because uh, CFI graphs do. So um, that's, that's, ah, that's it's like, especially to our family. Like your Immermann graphs sitting inside there and those yes. you can, yes, yes. I see with yeah. linear algebra. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Please. Um, so can you comment on what happens if you're allowed to, to color group elements? So I mean, for graphs, this is quite a natural operation that we are allowed to color vertices. So do you have any idea what happens if we are allowed to color group elements, let's say with respect to complexity of the isomorphism problem, but also with respect to weisfeller lehmann dimension? Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a very interesting question, uh, especially um, if you know the theory of these things in terms of graphs, where, where this is, of course, uh, yeah, there are many standard results in, in this uh, respect at this point, I guess. Um, for groups, it's really difficult. So um, one of the more subtle points here maybe is that um, for graphs, you can actually um, you have you have nice reductions of, of the isomorphism problem of colored graphs to to to, to non-colored graphs and these things. So you can um, by by using gadget constructions or, or something, you can get rid of colors. And for groups, this is uh, yeah, I, I I would not know how to do this. So um, of course, you can take colors into account, and then these algorithms still work, and you can can look at them. But at this point, I don't know how colors can help really. So I, I have been looking into this, um, but it's yeah, it's it's really difficult to see how colors can help in a way they can be helpful with, with graphs. Uh, but but yeah, these are certain certainly interesting directions to to look into. Yes. 
Um, then there may be an intermediate question. I mean, the Cypher Immermann graphs are, are colored in a standard way. Can you uh, modify this translation to take the colors into account, let's say, without taking the detour of, of first translating them to uncolored graphs? So that's, in a way, a bit simpler question, maybe. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I, I completely understand the question, to be honest. So, um, Well, I mean, now I, I take the, the, the colored Cypher in Maman graphs and yeah. not the colored ones. So obviously, I can translate them into a group by first translating the, the colored Cypher in Maman graph to an uncolored graph by the gadget construction, and then I can maybe translate this to yeah. a group by, by your construction. But I'm wondering whether there is maybe a more direct way for these specific examples. Mm, I see. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm afraid I can't give an insightful answer to this. Um, yeah, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question. But uh, yeah, when I mean, it's really hard to do these kinds of uh, combinatorial constructions in, in groups in the first place. So um, w one of the problems or one of the things we've, we've seen here is that uh, you, you can, um, but by embedding Cypher or Immermann graphs into groups, you, you get some sort of similarity because after all, these groups look similar and this similarity is due to them being CFI graphs. But yeah, you, have, you always have this exponential overhead and, and things get uh get more complicated to uh yeah so i'm I, I i would i would not know how to do this other than than going uh, via uncolored graphs first okay thank you are there any other questions So I guess you present three versions of Westphalian Lehmann on, graph, uh, on graphs. So when you talk about in your main result, this Westphalian Lehmann dimension three, uh, uh, which one do yeah. you? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question, of course. Um, we just take some version as a standard notion because it appears most natural to us. Um, so usually when we speak about some fixed constant dimension in the paper we mean it in a in a formally well-defined sense like we, we take version two because this is actually uh yeah the most natural for us and then the other versions can differ by a by a global constant in terms of this dimension um yeah and then for some results it really doesn't matter because you can show that for each of these versions it's actually two but, but usually we just mean it in the sense of uh, we take one fixed version, which is natural for us. So what makes three uh, so special? So in CFI graphs, you have for each K you have in the construction, but uh, here you, you, you just can prove three. Something. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is basically due to, or I guess this is due to the fact that, um, so these, these things really, only makes sense from two onwards for groups, mm -hmm. or, or let's say you can define things which are kind of one dimensional or two dimensional, but, but after all, multiplication is a ternary relation. And I guess that's the main point here. So to, to take this ternary relation into account fully, you probably need three. And that's what we needed in, in the proofs. Um, but yeah. So do you know any examples that cannot be distinguished by two-dimensional Weisweiler Lehmann? Um, actually, yes, but I don't understand these examples. So uh, I have a collection of groups which cannot be distinguished by the two-dimensional version. Um, but these appear to be, so, uh, so far, these are all two groups, interestingly, or maybe not if you, um, yeah, if you think that the two is a prime, which can make uh, trouble in, in 
in, in these things. Um, but I don't see that there's a lot of structure to these groups. Okay, where do they come from? Uh, just just uh, experiments, like oh, uh, okay. actually computing things on, on small groups, going through gap libraries and, and stuff. Uh, yeah, so um, there, there appear to be some small groups which are invariant with respect to two-dimensional vice Feller Lehman refinement. Uh, I know that all of them would be distinguished by three-dimensional vice Feller Lehman refinement, but this is again basically due to these groups being small. So uh, yeah, that's also not very conclusive, I, I guess. Okay. But so, there are there are many algebraic invariants uh, where two is not enough. Um, so, for example, if you want to look at commutators, uh, you you basically already need two pebbles to to fix a commutator or to look at interactions of two group elements um, and let them commute or not. And and if you want to do anything additional, then you you already need three. So uh, there there are many algebraic invariants for which two is probably not enough, but three is enough. Okay. Yeah, I see. I have more of a background question. So is this uh, isomorphism problem understood for other algebraic uh, classes of objects, not groups? Yeah? Some, pick, pick your favorite class of, I mean, I don't know, finite. Uh, has this been studied? Why groups? Yeah? I mean, one can look at other algebraic structures. Yeah, sure. Um, so I personally don't know a lot about other structures. Um, I maybe know the most about group related structures like uh, semi groups or loops or, or quasi groups or something. Um, but yeah, they are. So for semi groups, I guess it's not that interesting because uh, yeah, basically they, they are too expressive. So um, it's, it's basically the same as for graphs. And, and on the other hand, for, for quasi groups, I at this point, I don't see um, that it would be actually easier. Um, or yeah, it basically looks like the group case. So uh, why groups, um, for, for me, um, a lot of my background is in group theory and, and structure theory of groups. So I, uh, I personally like groups as algebraic objects and, and think that structure theory is really interesting. Um, but then again, this problem is also related to, to the graph isomorphism problem in a special way, at least in the sense that groups turn up in, in investigating the graph isomorphism problem a lot, I guess. So, um, and, and, and through, through Baba's work, we, we know that there are certain obstructions to graph isomorphism, which are in a sense group theoretical and, and all these things. So I guess it's it's a natural class to consider, um, but yeah, of course, um, especially with respect to weisfeller lehmann refinement, you could look at other structures. And um, as far as I know, there's uh, at least in terms of weisfeller lehmann refinement and, and algebraic structures, there's not a lot of uh, literature, other than for graphs, of course. Thank you. Okay, so. I guess we have run out of time. And thanks a lot for every speaker and all the participants. It's a very nice session. Thank you all. Thanks to the chair. Thank you.